Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to The Source for the December lecture from the Tipperary People and Places series. Tonight, we welcome Carl O'Donoghue and Des Murnan, and together they're going to bring the exploration of the extraordinary period in Tipperary to a close with Tipperary 1923. We already had Tipperary 1919, and now we continue after five years to bring the revolutionary period to a close. So a warm welcome to Des and to Cahill. Thanks very much, Mary. And in case I forget at the end, seasonal greetings to everybody. Um, I hope you have a, a wonderful Christmas. Uh, it's been a bloody long 10 years. I mean, uh, when I was preparing this, just thinking back to how long ago the Great War seemed when we were doing material in relation to it. But then, of course, COVID intervened, and that made, yes, that, that made the period seem even longer. Um, for myself, I won't be sorry to be leaving the period, um, having lived with it so much. Um, it was a consolation of a sort during the lo various lockdowns, so in that sense I'm kind of thankful to it. But at the moment I've moved on to dealing with land issues. And uh, just a brief advertisement, hopefully next year I will have what I would think of as kind of the third volume to go with, the Third Brigade book and the Civil War book, a book that I'm going to call From Landed Estates to Family Farms, because basically modern Irish history is the national question and the land question. Well, with two books dealing with the national question, I think the land question might have one book on its own, but anyway, that's for next year. Um, uh, if you haven't been at this kind of talk before, the format is, um, because it's very much documents-based, as I always have to remind some people and myself, um, history is not creative writing. While it might be written creatively, it's not actually creative writing, so it is documents-based. And so um, having, but e even there, there is a choice to be made because Obviously, I, I chose the documents that are going to, but I hope that you will agree that they're, you know, a reasonable cross-section. Um, basically, right, it's 1923, but the focus is obviously on the early months of 1923, when stuff was happening. And I'm in no doubt, you know, having kind of lived with the period, that those early months of 1923 really stand on their own in terms of just sheer misery and waste. And I think made worse by the fact that no lessons had been learned from the almost as miserable um, months at the end of 1922. And if you want to put um, a figure on it, during those early months of 1923, 41 lives were lost in the county. Um, I'm not sure what for. Uh, each life is as precious as the other, but if you want the statistics, um, five IRA Republican lives lost in January, eight Free State lives, two civilian. That was the January toll. The February toll, three Republican, two Free State, three civilian. And one would focus particularly on the civilians because they didn't ask to be killed, you know. They were just the wrong place, wrong time. In March, four Republican, four Free State, one civilian. And then in April, of course, the, the, the attrition is working against the IRA and there are five, whereas there's only one Free State casualty. So you can see the way the, the pattern is going. What's maybe more interesting than those figures, if you want to know where the action was within the county um, of those casualties, I'm looking now at the, the entire Civil War, um, which includes the end of 1922. Um, just 5% of the fatalities are mid Tipperary, which is exactly what you'd expect if you understand what was going on in mid Tipperary. 22% were north Tipperary, but in a colossal 73% were south. Again, there's no surprise in that, but it's just interesting to put the figures. So I'm starting in terms of our documents, a, a, a source I've used quite a lot because it's a, a very interesting um, uh, conservative, with a small c, uh, obviously pro-treaty source, and that's Father uh, Michael Maher, who is here in Thurlis, a um, man from Bohor Lahan. Easiest way to explain who he was, he was an uncle to T.J. Maher. Um, and uh, if, 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 if you had time to spare, uh, his, his memoirs or his journals are here in the library and uh, they're well worth um, looking at. So this basically is our first document and it's, it's his, how he greeted the new year of 1923. And as I say, he's, he's very much looking at things from a, a pro-treaty perspective. Okay. Father Michael Maher on the new year 1923. 
The Archbishop entertained us on New Year's Day and the Epiphany, as usual. Dr. McCaffrey, President of Maynooth, spent a week with him after Christmas. He went to Dublin on Monday the 15th to the meeting of the Standing Committee of the Bishops, which was held on, held on Tuesday the 16th. He met Dick Mulcahy in Dublin, who told him that they expected to have the country pacified in about two months. The Standing Committee issued no statement. He returned on Wednesday, as there was no train on Monday morning, owing to the wrecking of the line near Listuff, he motored to and from Dublin. He stayed in Maynooth on Monday and Tuesday night. Since the new year opened, there has been no abatement of the fighting and destruction that marked the close of 1922. It is extraordinary all the deaths that occurred about Christmas from other than natural causes. Up to eight people were drowned in the shore near Clonmel. Sorry, just to interrupt you, that wasn't an accident. The Republicans had destroyed the bridge. Okay. A number of national soldiers were shot by the accidental discharge of their own or their comrades' rifles. A soldier from Dublin, who was stationed at Gould's Cross, shot his father dead while showing him the working of his rifle. Several civilians were shot dead by armed men in different places for unknown causes. A widow and her seven young children were burned to death in their own house in Wexford, through some hay being set on fire close to the house. Five people were roasted to death in a fire in a Dublin shop caused by a starlight thrown by a youth on a barrel of oil. A driver and fireman were killed in Kerry on an engine that was wrecked on a part of the line torn up by irregulars. Right, now notwithstanding Mulcahy's kind of optimism that the war would be over within a few months, the military side of the Republican cause was firmly in the driving seat and the political side obviously was pushed, pushed to the margins. And throughout the Civil War, on the Free State side, there was tremendous tension between the military and the civilian. And in the end, of course, th that civilian side triumphed. Uh, and the long-term result of that, of course, was the emasculation of the Irish army. They were very much put in their box and kept there. With the Republicans, the civilian part of the equation was cast aside. So it's kind of mirror images of, the of, uh, of each other. And if you, you know, just think about de Valera, kept to a side room when the people who were running the war were, were meeting, which again, of course, is, is, is uh, an explanation why the Neil Jordan film is so unfair to de Valera. And if you remember, you've seen the film, if you remember it, um, it its portrayal of him is... Because is he he, he, at that stage, he was marginalised, and that's not the impression that the, the film was giving. Anyway, going into 1923, that was the review from the, from the, the Free State side. The review, review from the Republican side comes from Dan Breen's... Um, witness statement, which again is, is, is problematic, and I've, I've kind of written about that before, because A, it's dealing with the Civil War, and the Bureau of Military History stuff wasn't supposed to deal with the Civil War at all, um, and, and his does. And the other thing is, of course, it's not written by him, even though it's under his name. Um, I, I inquired from the, the, the chap who runs the military history, the, the um, archive in Dublin, could he kind of figure out what was going on there, that you had this very large statement, it runs to 170 pages or something, that's under Breen's name, because there is a second, he has two statements, um, and it's under his name, um, could they figure out what was going on, and th they did have a look, because there is also th an account of the circumstances under which the statements were made, which I don't think has been released yet, so, so there was somewhere for him to look, but he, he had no answer as to what exactly was going on there. Um, it's related to the fact, I think, that it only went in when, when Robinson went out, because he was involved with that archive too. So, but so it's, 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 it's complicated and messy. But it's a very good Republican source, and again, you can access it online. It's, it's very much a Republican account, and it's very accurate, it's, it's very good. Anyway, this is the Republican take at the start of 1923. The year 1923 opened inauspiciously for the 3rd Tipperary Brigade. Free State columns operating in the Tullamane and Lisrona districts discovered a number of dugouts and, what was worse, army documents, a printing press, and a fairly large quantity of arms and ammunition. Five prisoners were taken, one of whom was wounded. These events occurred on Sunday, January the 7th. I think the, the most important thing about um, kind of that turnover from 1922 to 23 is, of course, as you moved into 23, the Republicans had already lost the war. 
I mean, there isn't any doubt about that, but they fought on. You might even argue that the war had been lost the previous April before it had actually begun. It always amazes that people never learn the lesson from history. In April 1916, the rebels seized buildings in the center of Dublin. We all know that. Using artillery, they were bombed out of it. Just six years later, April 1922, Republicans seized the four courts. Now, it was a bit more difficult to use artillery against your own people, but nonetheless, within time, they were also bombed out of it. So from a kind of a military point of view, it didn't make a lot of sense, and that really wasn't where their strength was on, on, on the Republican side. Uh, they were much stronger outside of Dublin. Um, you might even say that somebody like Rory O'Connor ensured defeat for Republicans even before the Civil War began by focusing the whole struggle in, in, in Dublin in the early stages. Um, Munster is where you know, a lot of the, the, the lead IRA players, um, the names that you know, kind of are famous and were even famous then, um, and, and most of those were anti-treaty. Um, with respect to the IRA, most of the, as I said, of the key personalities outside Dublin, Collins obviously had a lot of influence in, in, in Dublin, um, and that was particularly the case with the 3rd Tipperary Brigade, and again, if you those figures I cited, the 70-something percent of the fatalities being in South Tipperary, well, that relates obviously to the 3rd Tipperary Brigade, which didn't have to draw breath to decide that they were going to oppose the treaty. And of course, on, on two famous occasions during the so-called truce, they had raided for arms in Tipperary Town and in Clonmel, so they were very well stocked and ready to go, and determined to go um, for, for the Republic. Um, and it made no difference to them or to anybody else, apparently, that militarily the struggle was futile by the end of 1922. By mid-22, just to go back a little bit, they were in control, as you'd expect, of Clonmel, Carrick, Cashel, Care, Tipperary. Um, given their strength in South Tipperary, there's no surprise in any of that. Thurles, of course, they failed to get hold of. That remained Free State, even though they did their best. Um, but during the summer months, the Free State, of course, built up their army. You know, time was with them. So they had their numbers and the equipment, but they didn't have the experience, which is why, if you remember in, in, in the thing from Father Maher about the father coming down and the son shooting him while he was showing, I mean, that, that was a, it's, it's a very good single example of, of the ineptitude of the lack of training with regard to a lot of the soldiers who joined in, in with, with the Free State. So once they lost control of the, the towns, which was done by the summer of 1922, basically it's back to the past and the guerrilla campaign. Um, and so you ha then have a whole series of set-piece ambushes, and the fatalities are pretty, pretty horrific. 16 this is 1922, 16th of August, Woodruff near Clanmel, 18th of August, Kilfeekel, 21st of August, Redmondstown, which again is near Clanmel, 26th of August, Ballywilliam, which is near Nina, 13th, 31st of August, um, going in, coming between Tipperary and, and, and Cashel, 7th of September again, the road going into Clanmel from Care. 17th September, again, an ambush near Nina, and so on it goes. So that, that's the pattern during, during then. 9th of December, of course, um, with the leadership of Lacey, the Free State does have a kind of a moment when they're given a shock and when temporarily the Republicans manage to get control of Carrick, but of course that doesn't last. Um, but it, 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 it did come as a shock to the, the, the Free State side. And numbers, of course, matter, and the numbers are astonishing. By mid-November 1922, there were 1,900 Free State soldiers in 16 locations, uh, or 16 locations in Tipperary. I mean, that's a massive. I mean, during the days of the old RIC, they were all about saturation policing, which is why you had barracks everywhere. Well, this was very much saturation soldiering. So they were in Bansha, Borussia, Care, Carrick, Cashel, Clanmel, Feathered, Galbally, Golden, Nina, Ross, Gray, Silvermines, Templemore, Tumivara, Thurles, and Tipperary. And that's just one county, 1900. It's a massive number. So throughout the war in 1922, while the Free State lost its leaders at the very top, August, of course, Griffith and Collins. On the anti-treaty side throughout the war, it was slightly not as dramatic, but you had a constant attrition with respect to its leaders. O'Malley was captured, Childers executed in November. This is all towards the end of 1922. Um, O'Malley, very much the man of action. Childers, of course, the, the man with the message. Jack Killeen, one of the local leaders, was captured in September. Paddy Dalton was killed in October, Michael Sadler killed in November. And so, coming then into 1923, we we're only a few days into 1923 when Martin Breen, one of their guerrilla leaders in Tipperary, and is killed just outside Tipperary town. On that date, which was the 10th of January 1923, he had just come back home um, to get boots. I mean, it was as simple and as domestic as that because 
the life these people were leading was very hard on their footwear. Um, never mind any, any, any other aspect. And if, if you know Tipperary, he was shot. Um, if you know where Dunn's stores are in Tipperary on the Limerick Road, kind of at the back of Dunn's stores, he was shot there while crossing, while crossing a field. So this is our next document, and it's from the inquest on his death. And you'll hear two voices. The first voice, very briefly, is his brother, Michael, um, just kind of giving evidence of identification at the inquest. Um, the second is the more interesting one, and it's a commandant, Michael Leamy, and he was the guy in charge of the Free State Force that killed Breen. Okay. Mr. Michael Breen, New Road, Tipperary. I identified the body of my brother Martin in the morgue at Tipperary Workhouse. I last saw him at our father's house on the New Road at about a quarter to 2 p.m., a quarter of an hour before he was shot. He came home for a change of boots. He was aged 27 and was unmarried. Commandant Michael Leamy. Yesterday, the 10th of January, I was in charge of a party of military. When nearing the western side of Tipperary town, my attention was called to three men who were walking across a field. I called on them to halt, but they didn't stop. I thought that they didn't hear me, and our men shouted at them four times to halt. They didn't halt, but one man waved his hand, and all three men walked faster. I put a rifle on the bridge and fired a shot in the air to test who the men were. The three men ran immediately towards a gateway. I gave orders to my men to open fire, and they did so. As soon as the three men got cover at the ditch, they opened fire on us from behind it. I ordered some of the party to flank them. They did so and cut off their escape. One of the three men crossed the gate by which they had gone out. We surrounded them there. Their fire ceased after about three minutes, and we drew round them and found the deceased, who had a bullet wound through the head and who appeared to be dead. I found on him a long parabellum pistol with stock attached and ammunition for same. There was a bullet jammed in the breech. Okay, thanks. Now, as regrettable as, as that death was, and of course he still has family in Tipperary and there's a row of houses named for him, so he's certainly not forgotten. Um, but he was killed in action, and that's the 10th of January. But what happened on the 15th of January in Ross Cray was a very different matter. At the beginning of October 1922, the Free State Government offered an amnesty for an arms surrender, an offer that lasted for about two weeks, and thereafter the gloves were off. And no doubt with an essentially military figure like Collins out of the way, ironically, the more political leaders like Cosgrave, O'Higgins, Hogan, Blythe and so on were more ruthless and determined to end the war as quickly as possible. On the 6th of December 1922, the new Free State Constitution, just a year after the treaty was signed, came into operation. 7th of December, Sean Hale's TD, pro-treaty, was killed. 8th of December, then you had the reprisal killing of O'Connor, Mellows, Barrett and McKelvey. So the whole thing is becoming incrementally more vicious. But that's very bad timing for these three young men, Burke, O'Shea and Russell. Now they'd robbed a mail van near Barcelli two days before Christmas. Following a gun battle, they were arrested. Having a Thompson machine gun, not in their favour, and in the new draconian atmosphere, they were slated for execution along with Patrick McNamara, so it's three in one, whose crime, he, his crime, he's been found in possession of a rifle. And he had been arrested near Nina on the 20th of December, 1922. And in that month, again, they were very unlucky. It was very bad timing on their part. I mean, there were lots of others that could have been targeted. They happened to be targeted. In that month of January, 1923, there were 34 executions, and that's just four of them, the ones carried out in Ross Gray. Now, of the four, Patrick McNamara, who was 22. Now, he'd lost his mother, and our second document here, or the next document, is the letter he wrote on the eve of execution. He wrote it to a neighbour, slightly a curious letter. He wrote it to a neighbour, a Mrs Lyons. Um, his tone with her is an odd mixture of formality and closeness. And who was Mrs Lyons? Well, she was 40, married to Dennis Lyons since 1906, and they had three children. So, as I said, the tone of the letter is, is, is kind of odd. So this is the next. Ross Gray Barracks, January the 4th, 1923. Dear Mrs. Lyons, just a few lines to let you know that I am to be executed here at 8 o'clock on Monday morning. Maggie dear, I am quite happy as the priest was with me tonight and I will receive Holy Communion in the morning just before I will be shot. 
I feel very happy as the priests will be with me to the very last. And he told me I am all right and that I will be the very best of all that my poor soul shall, by, shall be saved. Don't cry or be lonely. I will be all right. I hope to be in heaven with my poor mother before you get my letter. All I ask of you is to pray for me and get a mass said for me. I wrote to Jack and told him to get me prayed for in Balana on Sunday. Remember me to all the lads around. Tell them that I am not afraid to die, that I will go to meet my God like a brave Irish soldier, as better men have done before me. I hope you yourself and Denny, Mary, Kathleen and Jack are in the best of health and also the neighbours. There are three more to be shot from the rag. Get Tuesday's paper, it will be worth tuppence. Maggie dear, I will say goodbye forever on earth. I hope we will meet in heaven with God's help. God is very good to me to give me such a chance for to save my poor soul, so I feel quite happy my last night on earth. I will say goodbye to Maggie and Denny, pray for me. Goodbye to Pat and Maggie. Farewell, poor old Killery. Goodbye to all. Goodbye to Ireland forever. Don't be lonely, Maggie. I am all right, thank God. Farewell, poor old Killery. May the Lord have mercy on my poor soul. The end. Right, it's 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 very odd mixture, as I say, of, of tones, but um the 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 moment of black humour when, when he remarks about buying the next paper, the story it's it's extraordinary really. Um looking at the larger picture, what's interesting about that is that the, 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 the there were only four executions in tip, um, but that they're north Tipperary. Um, and given what I said, that most of the action was in the south, you would expect the reprisal executions to be in the south. And there's a very good reason why they, why they weren't. Um, now, after these killings, obviously, uh, the south, the 3rd Brigade, um, issued threats, making it very clear that if, if there were reprisal executions in the south, that uh, they would take very drastic retaliatory action. And that's the explanation, I think, as to why there were no executions in the South. So this is the document that spells that out. Executions were also expected in South Tipperary. In Emmet Barracks, Clonmel, a number of prisoners, including Sean Cooney and Patrick Brennan, lay under sentence of death, having been captured in arms against the Free State Government. To prevent the execution of these men, the Brigadier and Vice Brigadier of the 3rd Tipperary Brigade issued a warning to the Free State military authorities and to certain public representatives known to support the Free State Government that they would be held responsible for the execution of any members of the brigade and would be dealt with accordingly. The warning received by members of public boards was as follows. Should any officer or man of the 3rd Tipperary Brigade area be executed in or outside the brigade area, you and certain members of your board will be deemed participants in the crime and will be dealt with accordingly. War, truce or peace. Signed, Dennis Lacey, William Quirk. And, and it obviously worked. Um, Sean Cooney that was mentioned there was from the main guard in Clamell. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to him later. And he later, because he survived obviously, he described how one of the Free State Generals, General Prout, got a letter from Dinny Lacey, very personally, one man to the other, um, stating that there should there be a retaliatory execution, Prout would be their primary target, and you know that 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 presumably had some some impact. Now, many years later, and this is uh, uh, the next source, and it's from somebody in Tipperary Town who, thankfully, wrote a memoir. Somebody born in 1900, so he was of an age where he wasn't an activist, but if he was born in 19, he was 22, 23 at this time, and um, looking back on these executions, which are part of his own lived experience. Um, this is what he had to say about them and uh, they're quite inter it's quite interesting comment. Pat Cranley's memoir. One Sunday morning during the winter as I was going to Mass, I saw members of Common Amon standing on the road opposite the church with a banner bearing the names of executed Republican prisoners. Every Sunday and Holy Day, there they were there with a banner bearing a new list of executed Republican prisoners and this continued until the Civil War ended. Kevin O'Higgins was considered a man of iron because he signed the death warrant for Rory O'Connor, 
who was best man at his wedding. The United States administration's reasons for dropping the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki were exactly as advanced 22 years earlier by the Komen Nagoyal government when they executed Republican prisoners to save further loss of life and destruction of property. Neither announced which of the two was the more important. And that's where the sting is in the tail there, that last comment, which I think is, is, is very pertinent. It is the case that the, the political leadership on the, on the free state side were very much um, angered, I think, by the destruction of property and infrastructure that was going on. Um, basically the destruction of state assets and it was obviously they were the people who were going to try and build up a new state and I think they were just driven to kind of fury. And a case in point is the burning of the Bagwell mansion which is Marlfield near Clonmel. That's on the night of the 8th of the 9th of January 1923. Uh, Bagwell of course died in, Richard Bagwell died in 1918. He was the kind of I suppose the most famous member of the family. For long he'd been a leader of Southern Unionism. He's now I suppose mainly remembered for the history books that he wrote. Um, the history of the Tudors and so on. Um, his son John, um, general manager of the Great Northern Railway, but more to the point, he had accepted a position in the new Irish Senate, so that made him a target, I suppose. And later that month, having burned down the house, the Republicans kidnapped Bagwell near his home in Hoth, so they kind of got a double dose. After a few days, Bagwell escaped. I think more likely was allowed to escape. Dan Hogan famous Tipperary man, um, worked for the railway in, in Monaghan, which is why he was involved with the IRA in Monaghan and subsequently was a free state general. Um, and of course he's a brother of the Bloody Sunday, Michael Hogan. Uh, he made, made it quite clear that um, if, if, if something happened to Bagwell that there would be massive reprisals. So I think it was in everybody's interest that, that Bagwell quote unquote escape. Anyway, th that was after the burning of Marlfield, but to come back to the burning of Marlfield, at a practical level, a reason given for such conflagration was that so that the enemy couldn't use the property. Now, that's probably true some places, but not true with regard to Marlfield. And in this instance, of course, it was, I think, retaliation for the support for the free state. Um, in other issues, the Greg No and Clark, the Clark estate, there were kind of residual land issues, so you know, these things are often quite complicated with various factors involved. And I think there was also, for many of the people, particularly those who actu did the actual burning, a kind of an atavistic feeling that, you know, they were now doing something that their fathers and grandfathers and great grandfathers didn't dare do, might have liked to do, but wouldn't have dared to, to do. Anyway, this is our next source, and it's an account from Mrs. Bagwell. Her husband wasn't at home, he was in Dublin, but she was there when this went on. So this is, she's Louisa Bagwell, this is her account of the burning of Marlfield. Just after midnight on Tuesday, 9th of January, a party of armed men, numbering in all upwards of 20, arrived outside our house, knocked loudly and kicked at the hall door. I opened the window to speak with them, and they stated that they wanted to come into the house and see Mr. John Bagwell. I replied that he was not there. They then said they would give us 10 minutes to clear out of the place, as they were under orders to burn it, owing to Mr. Bagwell being a member of the Senate set up under the Irish Free State. I said then that we must have time to dress, and they replied, all right, but that we must hurry and on no account to show a light. They had broken into the house by this time and spread all over it. I and my daughter proceeded to our rooms to dress and were followed by two of the men. I ordered them to go back, and they at first appeared to refuse, but at length turned back and left us. After about 10 minutes, we were brusquely ordered to leave and proceed to the stables where the servants were already assembled. I took with me my dressing bag containing my jewellery, but this was afterwards taken from me by one of the men. I also asked a man who appeared to be the leader of the party whether we could take away a few of our family pictures, and this they allowed us to do, one of them even assisting in taking down the paintings. We were then brought to the courtyard and herded in the stables with the servants, where we were kept for some time. At length we were released, and my daughter immediately let off all the horses. When we came out from the courtyard, the house was entirely ablaze, and the men had all gone away. The house was completely destroyed, with the exception of the kitchen, scullery, stables, and maids' apartments. The library, which had thousands of books, was destroyed. Right. Now, a few days later, um, obviously it's a big story at the time, 
Louisa Bagwell felt the need to clarify because various stories circling around. So she wrote to the press to clarify. Now, obviously, she didn't write to the Nationalists. She wrote to the Clonmel Chronicle, um, which would be much more a kind of a unionist paper, just to clarify what, what, what did and what didn't happen. Sir, when your reporter called me, we were too tired to give him details clearly. Your description is quite accurate, with the exception of a few details. The man who kept a scarf around his face was not the leader, only a guide, I should think. He took care never to speak when we were near. The leader was a complete stranger to us, and he and his men did not attempt to disguise themselves in any way. I see some papers say they fired over Miss Bagwell's head, but they offered no personal viol violence to us in any way. Two of them with revolvers stopped Miss Bagwell from going to the stables, but the leader let her go, also my sons, with guards. They appeared to acquiesce in our taking our small personal effects out onto the lawn, where we gathered them under rugs, and when the leader told us to go to the coach house, he said, you can leave your things there, they will be quite safe. And we believed him, but when we were liberated, we found all coats, some trousers, a gilt-handled dirk and my dressing bag had been looted. A few things from my bag were found along the route of retreat, but they kept the jewellery, silver brush, etc., and six pounds, which was in an envelope, also two gold watches. Perhaps the leader was not aware his men were looting, yours, etc. Now, again, it's, it's interesting that the, the people doing the active uh, kind of burning and attacking the house were apparently not local, but there was somebody local, which is why he disguised his face, which was probably a fairly standard operating procedure. And it's also interesting, of course, that there was much more concern in, in, in Republican circles about the accusation of looting than there was about burning the actual house down. So, you know, these things are, are, are quite, quite relative. Now, from the Republican point of view, I mean, you know, at this stage they were had, t had lost control of towns, they'd taken to the countryside, and they were living off the land. It was very difficult, of course. Um, they had to take what they wanted when they could get it. Um, there was a lot of resentment about the government, which they regarded as illegitimate. But they had access, the Free State people, to the state's resources. Um, so it's not surprising that you know, there was a, a degree of kind of anger about that and a determination that y they were entitled to take what they wanted to take. Um, interestingly, of course, had Dennis Lacey been involved in that, the whole looting thing would have driven him frantic because he was absolutely scrupulous about He didn't mind people being killed in certain circumstances, but the whole looting thing would have, he would not have stood for that at all. Now, ten days after Marlfield, see a lot of happened. We're still only kind of beginning of 1923. Huge amount is happening. Ten days after Marlfield was burned, the Republican number two, who's D Liam D.C., he was captured near Care, and this is the official government statement about his capture. And that was a huge setback, of course, to the Republicans to lose their number two. Liam D.C., calling himself Deputy Chief of Staff, was arrested by a Care column of troops at Ballincurry on the 18th of January, under the name of John Hurley. He was at first unidentified, but later his identity was established. He was tried by court-martial on the 25th, charged with having in his possession, without proper authority, one long parabellum revolver and 21 rounds of ammunition. He was found guilty and sentenced to death, which sentence was duly confirmed, but before it was carried out, DC requested an interview with Commander-in-Chief Mulcahy, stating that it was for the future of Ireland and intimating that the question of peace had been having his consideration prior to his arrest. In view of the position he held in the irregular forces, arrangements were made to convey DC to Dublin, where the situation was discussed with him, and on the 29th he was facilitated in forwarding the following communication to certain of his associates all executions being suspended for a period, pending developments. DC's communication read as follows. I have undertaken for the future of Ireland to accept and aid in an immediate unconditional surrender of all arms and men. Now, of course, he being number two on the Republican side, that was a, you know, a, a big setback and something of a shock. Didn't make any difference to um, Liam Lynch. He was replaced as number two by one of the Maloney's from, from Tipperary Town. Um, 
one can accept DC's. I mean, you you could interpret it that he was doing all this to save his own life, but uh, you know, I'm perfectly prepared to accept his bona fides that he wanted to bring the war to an end, which is why he died in 1974, not in 1923. But I mean, you know, he was dealing with the dilemma so many others were dealing with: how do you end a war that you cannot win? And that's basically what we're talking about at the beginning of 1923. Now, not all of those who fought in the War of Independence took part in the Civil War. Sometimes we're inclined to think, you know, that there's a transference, and th they all took, but of course, many of them didn't. Um, some, th you know, they stood by on the sidelines, horrified, of course, by what was happening, with having, uh, you know, sympathies, because it was very personal for many of them. I mean, they'd been with these people. Um, some came together in various places and, you know, at various times, so called neutral IRA. And they had meetings in various places, and they tried to, but of course it was an entire waste of time. But it's very, very understandable why they would be motivated to do it. Um, but it really was, you know, you either supported the treaty or you didn't. Um, some of the people who were involved with the neutral IRA names, you know, you, you might recognize Jim Kilmartin, Brian Shanahan, Artie Barlow, Sean Nagel, Michael Ladrigan, Tygo Dwar. I mean, a lot of prominent names from the War of Independence. Now, this is uh, from a speech by D.P. Walsh, again, very prominent involved in the, 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 the quartermaster's agency uh, nationally during the War of Independence. He was from Feathered, and he was one of the neutral people. And this is a speech he delivered at a meeting in Care. And basically, it, it highlights the, the, the view of people like him about the Civil War. Okay. We fought against Britain, and we fought to preserve the comradeship that then existed amongst us. We have one section of our countrymen on the hills, and another section in the barracks. We must do our best to see that both sections come together and that old affectionate comradeship between them is restored. We bear no ill will to any member of the old crowd on either side who fought against the black and tans and we all deplore that they are shooting one another. The people of Ireland look to the ex-members of the IRA to save them from a further prolongation of this disastrous war. A war that could have been avoided and a war which if the people who are responsible for the waging of it could only have foreseen the consequences, would never have been started. I am not going to say who is responsible for this war. I am not going to say who is right and who is wrong. But I can say that our first duty is to Ireland and to her unfortunate people. If this struggle continues much longer, it will not matter what government we have, for we will have nothing to govern but chimney pots. Now, it's a very good summary of, of that despairing pers perspective. Um, and the beginning of 1923 was impossible for them to figure out how it might end. A lot, of course, hinges on the attitude of Liam Lynch, who was the leader, the military leader on the Republican side. Now, there is a kind of paradox, which I did touch on before, which I, I find fascinating, that the anti-treaty side, very much driven by the military wing, the political side was completely kind of marginalized. Whereas on the pro-treaty side, it was the politicians who were dominating, and the military side was very much kept kept in their box. Um, so you know, you had opposite positions, which is quite interesting. Now, for Lynch, at this stage, was hiding out in Dublin. One of the stories that was circulating, apart from what happened to DC, was that somebody as prominent as Tom Barry might be kind of doing a dance with the neutral people and trying to, because anybody who had any degree of intelligence at this stage was trying to answer that question, which I pose: How do you end a war that you can't win? And, and Barry was one of the people. So anyway, I think that and other th factors forced Lynch to come south. Uh, I mean, being in Dublin was an entire waste of time for him. He should south was where it was all happening. Now, the information we have about that is basically comes from Todd Andrews' memoir, um, you know, famous obviously subsequently, and member of a famous family. Um, but at this stage, he's a very young man, and he's traveling with, with, with Lynch. Um, one of the, the, the views he has of Lynch, which again, fits into a, 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 a picture we would understand about people from that time. He was very conventionally religious, you know, said the rosary every night, no matter how tired he was. Um, had very strong Roman Catholic beliefs, but at the same time um, had no problem with the view that the bishops should keep out of politics. Um, he didn't see any contradiction in that. Um, he couldn't understand somebody like Collins bringing the nation under the sovereignty of the British crown or how partition. So there's a political naivety, certainly. And and this this is my view on him. This is Andrews who was with him, um, and I think it's an interesting quotation from Andrews. I found it difficult to understand why he was so blind 
to the realities of the military position in which the IRA found itself. He had developed some mental blockage which prevented him from believing uh, that we could be beaten, um, which he appears to have, have done. It's very hard to understand. Um, this is, uh, next is, is, is an account of Lynch's uh, journey through Tipperary. He's going down to the border, Waterford, Cork, Tipperary, where they're trying to have meetings to decide what to do. Okay. Liam Lynch's journey through Tipperary as told by Todd Andrews. The night was spent at a house near Muthel in Waterford at the foot of the Cummer Mountains. Next day we set out to cross the mountains. It was a most unpleasant journey, a wet and windy climb over ground that was little better than a swamp. We were very tired, wet and hungry when we reached a friendly house in the Nair Valley. From the Nair Valley we continued, always on, fit, on foot and mainly by night, till we reached the Tar River near Newcastle. The river was in full spate, but the locals thought we would have no difficulty fording it in a pony and trap. The flood was very strong, and the pony stumbled several times, finally lurching so much that the trap was nearly swamped. We arrived at a place called Glenacona near Ballyporeen, and spent the night, and left very early next morning, pushing on over the Knockmeal Downs to Arad Lynn, where Tipperary, Cork and Waterford meet. In Arad Lynn, Liam was in his own country. Right, now Lynch and Andrews spent a few days at Arad Lynn while a message was sent to Lynch's number two, who's Con Maloney, and he was hiding out in the Glen of Ahalo. But um, no response to this. Maloney was already otherwise occupied. Lynch was then dispatched to um, find other leaders. Um, I think he ran into Dan Breen in the Glen and so on. But again, anyway, you have to understand the huge difficulty with the saturation um, by free state soldiers in these areas of just moving around, never mind trying to get four, five, six people together so that they could have a meeting. It was extraordinarily difficult. So this is the continuation of that account. From Mountain Lodge, with some difficulty, a guide was found to take me over Galtie Moor into Arlo and introduce me to the IRA there. We climbed over Galtie Moor in relatively fine weather, dropping down into Arlo where we quickly made contact with the IRA in the person of Dan Breen, whom I met for the first time. Rather to my disappointment, I caught with him drinking hot port wine in a pub called the Caravansary. Which is still there. Though not open. Mm -hmm. Not open, unfortunately. Not open. Dan told me of the capture of Con Maloney in the course of one of the many sweeps the Free Staters had been mounting throughout Arlo. Yeah, now Con Maloney, as I say, had been appointed after DC had been captured. He had been appointed number two. And now he was captured along with his brother and Tom Conway. They'd been taken in Ahala on the 7th of March, 1923. So, you know, really, by now, the Republican leadership is being overwhelmed by just the sheer weight of numbers. Um, a few weeks before that, the 18th of February, there was a gun battle in the Glen of Ahala, and um, Dennis Lacey was killed. Um, it, that also accounts for one of the civilian casualties. There was a story um, when the pension claims came online, as you know, they came online in various tranches, well, well, th that this was the, the child who was killed in that engagement in the Glen um, was the youngest member of the IRA. Uh, you might remember it became a kind of a, a press story. It was, of course, nonsense. No 10-year-old was a member of the IRA. It was the family chancing their arms, trying to see could they get some compensation from, from the state. They didn't, of course. Um, don't believe everything you read in the press, I suppose, is the, is the message from that. But again, that child, just, just to look at, I mean, he, he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, what, what was the value of, of, of his life being lost through, through all this nonsense, which, which is what it was by, by this time. But as I say, how do you end a war that you're, that you're losing? And it all comes down, of course, to the role of Lynch. So this is our, our, our next, um, and it's, it's the, as I say, Dennis Lacey was killed. Um, he was, at this stage, the most important of the leaders in, in Tipperary. Um, I always think of him very much as somebody who kind of replaced Tracy. He was uh, of that kind of caliber. Um, I'm not sure why he didn't have a higher national profile. I think he would have been a much better um, military leader than, than Lynch was. But, you know, we're never going to know the reality of that. So this is an account of his death in the Glen of Ahalo in February 1923. On Sunday the 18th of February, I left Tipperary with a party of troops proceeding to the Glen of Ahalo 
arriving at Kilmoyler at 6.30 a.m. From there, we proceeded across country to Bally David, where we arrived shortly after nine. I was walking down the road with the Lewis gun section when I heard shooting about a quarter of a mile further down. We came to a Ford car on the road. Two soldiers and myself with the Lewis gun entered it and proceeded to where the firing was in progress. When nearing the scene, we pulled up and located the house where the firing was going on. We walked up the road and one man near me had his rifle broken in his hand by a shot fired from the house. I ordered the man in charge of the Lewis gun to play upon the top window from which firing was proceeding. After a few seconds, I ordered him to cease. I rushed to the house and in the yard found three of my troops lying wounded with pools of blood around them. I rushed into the house but found nobody there. When I came out, there were five other soldiers in the yard along with the three who were wounded. I asked if they had any information about where the men went from the house. As a result of what they told me, 10 more soldiers came from the road. I went with them down the fields from the house. Two of our men were in front. There was an exchange of shots in which one of my men was wounded. After this discharge of shots, I found a man lying dead whom I did not know, but who, it transpired, was Dennis Lacey. At the same time, we made a prisoner of another man named William Allen. Now, the William Allen was, was a brother of um, Sean Allen, who had been fairly famously executed um, in Cork during the War of Independence. Um, that evidence comes from the captain who was in charge of the Free State Party. And, of course, you can take it with a grain of salt, because in, in, in writing up their reports, of course, there was a great deal of covering up. That's one account of, of the death of, of, uh, of Lacey. Um, this is a different account. It's 1949, and a man called Pat Ryan from Clara, which is where it happened, and he owned the house, um, and he was talking to somebody about what happened. So the event is 1923, so this is, a, this is an account using popular memory from 1949. Our house being so far from anywhere was considered a safe house. At the time I'm talking about, there were three IRA men staying there, Dinny Lacey being one of them. It was in the middle of February and it was after raining for two days non-stop. The river was in full flood. When we were gone to mass, a lorry of soldiers pulled up at the gate and immediately started firing. You can see some of the bullet holes in the windowsills still. The three IRA men ran off in different directions and the soldiers after them. Dinny, not knowing the area, ran on to this field, but of course he couldn't cross the river as he couldn't swim. I believe the soldiers caught up with him just here, and even though he threw down his gun, they shot him dead. Of the two events, of the two versions, um, I wasn't there, so I don't know. But if I had to pick, I'd pick the second one as being the more likely. Um, now, during the inquest on, on Lacey, um, occurred one of those moments that totally brought home to me just the appalling nature and the absolute horror of what was going on. Um, at the inquest, the solicitor representing the military, the Free State military, was a man called James Darcy, who had a practice in Tipperary Town, which is where the inquest was taking place. And being a solicitor, he was from a kind of a middle-class business family, which is what you'd expect. And if, if, you, if you know Tipperary, um, it's, it's at the corner of Main Street and James Street. It's an optician's now. And his family had a, had a business there, and that's where he grew up. And one of the people working in their business as a shop assistant and living in was Dennis Lacey. So, uh, who was older than Darcy. So, um, as, as Darcy explained, he slept in the next room to Lacey for seven years. So he would have known him, you know, extraordinarily well. And so here now he's acting for the people who shot him in the inquest. As I said, it's just one tiny little vignette, but it kind of, you know, brings home to one just the, the sheer awfulness of what was, was happening. Now, um, as I said, there's a great whitewash on the part of the Free State I I in, in these endeavours. And by March, the Republican enterprise basically falling apart. More and more roundups, more and more arrests. 
Um, I like this one. St. Patrick's Night, the Free State soldier surrounded a hall in Kilconnell near Feathered, where a dance was being held. In charge of the government troops was Lieutenant Clancy. We'll come to him again. On entering the hall, famously, and uh, uh, maybe amusingly, his orders were, ladies to the left, gentlemen, hands up. And so 17 men were arrested, taken to Feathered, and on the following day, which was a Sunday, they were marched to Clonmel. Now, there is an outcome to this. Because one of the men arrested is Jerome Lyons from Newchapel. And like so many other members of the IRA then and previously, in private life he was a grocer's assistant. I mean, so many of them were shop assistants of one kind or another. He was kept in custody at Clonmel, Barstow, which they were using to keep prisoners since his arrest. And then on the 4th of April he was shot dead in Clonmel military barracks where he'd been brought for questioning. They said by accident. Now, the Free State Army was embarrassed, of course, by this happening while he was in custody. And to save face, rather than there being a military inquiry, there was an inquest by the coroner's jury. Now, Lyons was repeatedly questioned while he was in custody, as it seemed, why were they targeting him? Well, it would appear that they thought he was complicit in the killing of a Free State sergeant, a guy called Thomas McGrath, who had been murdered and his body found dumped on the road near Clareham some time previously. So that's why they were targeting him. I've known no idea whether what his level of involvement was. Anyway, this is the evidence to the inquest, and so the Free State officer is unnamed for obvious reason. You know, in, in this instance, they were protecting their identity. So he was asked questions by one of the jurors, and so here we begin. The officer is describing the situation, and the juror is asking him questions. I remember that evening. I was detailed to interrogate the prisoner at the military barracks. I questioned him after the last witness. Another officer was present when I questioned him. There was no other prisoner there at the time, to my knowledge. I was armed while interrogating the deceased. The other officer present was taking notes, and I do not know if he was armed. Officers are usually armed on those occasions. Had you a revolver in your hand? I had. All the time? Yes. Did the deceased make statements to you? No. I asked him why he would not answer the previous witness's questions, and he seemed to treat me as an insignificant individual. Would the word truculent describe his attitude? He was savage. That is the way to describe him. What distance was he away from you? About a yard away from me. After he assumed the savage attitude, what happened? He said, I'll be damned if I answer any more questions. When he said that, did he do anything? He then grabbed my revolver. Had you your finger on the trigger? Certainly. He grabbed the revolver and pulled it towards him. What happened when he pulled it towards him? A shot went off and he fell forwards. I sent for a priest and a doctor immediately. And then a different juror asks the question, what was the necessity for holding a drawn revolver? Because I was doing guard and interrogating officer at the same time. That may be so, but I cannot see the necessity of holding a drawn, cocked revolver. It was not cocked. It was a self-cocking revolver. You were making an insinuation I had a cocked revolver. I'm not. I am making an insinuation that you had in your hand a revolver that could be cocked with strong pressure. And so after a demonstration as to the working of the weapon, the juror withdrew his statement as to a cocked revolver. Was there any necessity for having a revolver pointed at a man in his position? He was a prisoner, well guarded, and could not escape. Well, I was guarding him by a wall, outside of which was the public road. As a matter of fact, I have asked for this inquiry in order to have the matter fully cleared up. I'm not denying that. If it was a weapon that could be discharged by grabbing at it, I can understand it. Is it usual to have a revolver interrogating a prisoner? We have no guard. Considering the type of prisoners we have to deal with, it is very necessary. If a prisoner appears inclined to give information, he is not questioned before soldiers or others, but taken to a private place. The deceased gave information, and seeing his mistake and his disloyalty to his principles, he got savage about it. It seems extraordinary that if a prisoner was inclined to give information, he was not questioned before soldiers or others, but taken to a private place and had a revolver pointed at him. Anyway, on it goes and gets nowhere. Now, you can make up your own mind. Again, I'm not in any doubt as to what is going on. Um, maybe I've seen too many movies, but you could imagine a, a game like roulette being played put pressure on him and it just goes wrong. I mean, again, I wasn't there, I don't know, but there is a degree of cover-up going on, I'm not in any doubt about, about that. Um, 
again, it's just one tiny little incident. I mean, as I say, there are 41 casualties during this period, January to, to May, and this is just one of them. And they each have their individual awful stories. Um, clearly, there's a huge degree of skepticism on, on one side and a, a small amount of embarrassment on, on, on the other. Um, bearing more responsibility than his supporters will ever allow, of course, you know, was the man in charge. And this is where we get to the tricky thing about the role of Liam Lynch, um, about, you know, there's r a new biography written quite recently, which, which the third, there are two others. Um, again, interesting, worth, worth reading. Um, as mentioned, on the 7th of March, 1923, Con Maloney, who was the number two, was taken in, in Ahalo. Um, and with them, of course, there were various documents captured, which was always the, the, the problem. I mean, it was never just the individuals that were killed or taken. Quite often they had documents with them. Um, and, and again, there was a degree of embarrassment ab about that, including correspondence from Lynch, which again, even at that stage, was making, um, his extraordinary optimism. Again, a quotation, this is from Lynch. If we finish with the free state, in other words, when we beat them, it will be easy to talk to England. Extraordinarily naive. Now, this was, you know, crazy stuff. Um, in January 1972, we're coming now to the, the death of, of, of Lynch. In January 1972, the Evening Herald made a big splash with the publication of Larry Clancy's account of the death of Liam Lynch. And Clancy died in 1956. The account was written in 1953. And we mentioned him before, but he was the lieutenant in the Free State Army, very much involved in that sweep that ended up in, 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 in um, Lynch being killed. Uh, the Free State at this stage was deploying enormous resources um, to try and capture the, the, the leadership. Um, so coming near the end, these are two accounts of the death of, 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 of um, Liam Lynch. Um, again, you can make up your own mind. And this is Clancy's account. He's a Free State officer. At approximately 0500 hours on the morning in question, 10th of April 1923, we arrived at Goaton Bridge, halfway between Clahine and Newcastle. At this point, there is a Boreen, or second-class road, leading up from the main newcastle Clahine road towards the foot of the Knockmeal Downs, and at least five or six families reside along it. As we moved again in the new direction uphill, a burst of firing opened up on us, from an eminence on the right, and a few hundred yards in front of us, splinters flew from the rocks, along with whizzing bullets. I ordered the men to take cover, and running up a nearby rock, took out my field glasses to scan the hillside. I said, don't fire, they're probably our men, thinking they were the Dungarvan contingent coming in from Mount Mallory direction. About 400 yards in front and higher up, I was surprised to see a group of men daringly standing on rocks above us, wearing big black overcoats and hats and firing from Peter's and Parabellum autos with arms outstretched. I then knew they were Republicans, and I gave the range at 450 yards. We fired off five rounds, and I saw them jumping off the rocks before the bullets ceased to whiz around us. And then, using my glasses, I saw them running down the hill towards the skyline. I then observed a man fall forward and remain there. All stopped and two of the group turned back to him and began to drag him on his back away up the hill towards the remainder, who were going away hesitatingly. I shouted, We have got one of them. Fire again and don't let them take him. Fire was again opened up on us from the rear this time, and we were compelled to take cover. For a moment I thought we were surrounded, but suddenly I heard a voice away up on the hill in the direction where Captain Taylor and the men were. Stop firing, stop firing. These are Clancy and his party. It was our own men who opened fire on us. When we got near to where the man was lying on his back with a top coat folded under his head, one of our men said, we have Dev. But I knew Mr. De Valera by sight, so I said, no, it's not Dev. Who are you? And the man answered, I'm Liam Lynch. Get me a priest and a doctor. I'm dying. Again, interesting order of priorities. Now, that's the free state perspective. Now, this is an account by Moss Toomey, much later, I think, was himself an IRA chief of staff. And it's, again, same, different account. 
On the night, on the night of the 9th and 10th of April, 1923, General Liam Lynch and a party of officers were billeted a little south of Goaton Bridge at the foot of the Knockmill Down Mountains. At 4 a.m., scouts gave the alarm. A column of staters had appeared on the road moving towards Goaton Bridge. We rose and moved to a house higher up on the mountainside. Daylight came and looking to the north, we saw in the valley below us three columns of staters. We were not much alarmed. About 8 a.m., as we were about to have a cup of tea, a scout from the east ran in to tell us that another column was coming about 1,000 yards away across the mountains to our left rear. Our only line of retreat was thus threatened, and sending word to the scouts watching to the west, we dashed up a glen towards the mountains. On reaching the head of the glen, we halted to wait for the two scouts who were armed, one with a Thompson and the other with a rifle. We numbered seven. General Liam Lynch and five officers armed with revolvers and automatics and an unarmed local volunteer. We were carrying a great number of important papers which we wished to save at all costs. We were only a few minutes at the head of the glen and no sign of the scouts coming when the staters appeared over a rise and our first shots were exchanged. We dashed on again up the mountain, a shallow river bed affording us cover for about 250 yards. When we reached the end of the river bed, we had to retreat up a bare, coverless shoulder of the mountain. This was the chance for the staters. About 50 of them had a clear view of us at between 300 and 400 yards range, and they rattled away with their rifles as fast as they could work the bolts. Our return fire with revolvers was, of course, ineffective at that range, but as we staggered along up the mountain, we fired an odd shot to disconcert their aim. We had gone about 200 yards up the shoulders and the staters had fired over a thousand shots at us without effect when a lull came in the firing. After 20 seconds silence, a single shot ran out and Liam Lynch fell saying, my God, I'm hit lads. One officer, Sean Hyde, was helping him along at the time as he had been nearly exhausted with the run up the riverbed. Three of us, Frank Aiken, Bill Quirk and Sean Hyde gathered around him and found that he was badly wounded through the body. Our grouping together was the signal for intense fire from the staters. We picked him up and carried him along, one saying and he repeating the act of contrition. He was in terrible agony and the carrying hurt him terribly. Several times he told us to leave him down and at last after carrying him a couple of hundred yards further, again Liam told us to leave him down and ordered us to go on, saying, perhaps they will bandage me when they come up. We laid him down, took his automatic and notebook, and left him. It would be impossible to describe our agony of mind in thus parting with our comrade and chief. Um, I'm sure you, you know the, the outcome of that. He, he wasn't killed there and then, obviously, very badly wounded, and it must have been agony to, you know, remove him down to Clan Mano, where a short time afterwards, later that day, he did was allowed, um, the political voice of the anti-treaty cause, which of course means de Valera, was very much sidelined. Now Lynch was hardly dead when everything changed. Aiken, and of course as subsequent history makes clear, Aiken was de Valera's man. Within a few weeks, the military side of the conflict more or less ended. So that balance between the military and the political was changed with Lynch's death. Now it's all very untidy. Um, that's being done at the moment is UCC are working on a program to try and um, compile a list of Civil War fatalities. As you know, there was uh, Union O'Halpin and various others, War of Independence. Um, and it, it's, it's very difficult. Um, and they, they, in doing it, I suppose, otherwise it couldn't be done, they have picked a, a very specific date and said, right, that's the date of the war, that the Civil War ends. Um, because you know people kept on being killed for months um, after that happened. Um, the other odd thing, which again just a, a, a side note, that, that, that if you see the figures that will come from that UCC, that e even though we'll say you were involved in Tipperary, um, 
um, and were shot in Tipperary, but didn't die in Tipperary, but if you were free state and they were in control of Dublin and in control of the hospitals, and you were taken to Dublin and died in a Dublin hospital, they were then going to characterize you as a Dublin fatality. And so when you see the, the statistics, I mean, that's one of the things to... So the Dublin figures are going to be ridiculously uh, inflated. I'm not sure when they will have the uh, th these figures finished with, but it's something they're working on at the moment. Um, so just that's so something to, to um, there. And anyway, th the reason I came on to that was that there is no specific date that you can say, kind of, you know, that's the date that the Civil War ends. Um, the document, kind of two more things to, to cover. I mentioned before Sean Cooney, um, one of the people in in from Clonmel. Um, he was older than a lot of the other volunteers. He was 35 in 1923, and he had a business in the main garden in Clonmel. So he was not only older, he was also better off, and um, he put a lot of his own resources into, into the War of Independence and then subsequently the Civil War. He had been captured in December 1922, and when the Civil War petered out, he was being held in Clonmel. And then, of course, famously, um, there was a breakout um, of the prisoners from um, Clonmel. And this is account written in 1935 of the breakout from the old RIC barracks in Clonmel. This is mid-July 1923. And, um, you know, uh, at that stage the fighting has stopped. The story as told about that breakout is very much like one of these movies you might have seen where you see the... Um, prisoners of war in a, in a German camp and they're kind of digging underground and breaking out. It's, it's, it's very much like that. And um, this is Cooney's account of his escape. This is still 1923. The Civil War is over. And of course, a lot of the focus is on the huge number of Republican prisoners. Before escaping through the tunnel, we made an attempt to escape through the roof. I was badly injured in escaping by jumping off a high wall after coming through the tunnel, my hip being fractured. A free state officer fired at me while on the ground, but he had nothing up the barrel. I was dragged into the guard room along the ground where I was beaten with a hunting crop and kicked unmercifully by a free state officer. I was taken to hospital at the Curra, where I remained nine months being x-rayed five times and being operated on and two two-inch screws were being put in my hip to keep it together. I was not released until June 1924. Now, again, Cooney is, is one of these people who made, I think, a, a remarkable contribution, particularly in the War of Independence. As I said, he poured a lot of his own financial resources into the war. And again, you can look at his pension file, but again, it, it, it's an illustration of how, how, how mean the, the, the authorities were. Um, the fight he had to wage to try and get any, and even then I think he was just given as a, an E rating, which you know, was the, the, the most miserable that they could, could be given. And, and we finally come to our last document. This is the very last one. And this has never been published. And it was written by Teddy Burke from Care. And it was written to a female relative. And at this stage, she's been confined in Emmett Barracks. It's the same place from where the breakout took place, but it's before the breakout. And it's probably late March 1923. The Civil War is over, but these are among the casualties. And it was probably smuggled out. There's no way that this was done in any official ways. And he's writing to a, a family friend. Emmett Barracks, Clonmel, Tuesday. Dear Minnie, just a few lines hoping yourself and Jimmy are strong, also your aunt. I can imagine you being kept busy with her these times, not forgetting the two nurses. I got the books and cakes safe. Thanks very much for them. As for sending more, sure, we are not allowed parcels or letters at present, nor are we allowed to send out letters. That is in force since last Friday, and how long it is going to last, I do not know. So that will give you an idea how we spent St. Patrick's Day. Although I got your letter today, I do not know why. By the way, there was a couple of lines in your letter crossed off by the censor. It was about some fun you had driving through some place. I wish I could get a bottle of whiskey in. You may, sh may be sure it would get justice, but it's not allowed in. We would be delighted if you could get in to see us, but I doubt it. Fred has not gone to hospital. He is in the same cell as myself. He is not feeling too bad these days, but since the parcels are stopped, we are nearly starved with the hunger. I was asked to sign the paper, but I refused. Do not mention it when writing. 
When you meet Nell, ask her, did she get the letter I wrote to her about two weeks ago? Tell her to write. Remember me to the Milanis. I hope all are well in Valley Macadam. We are having the best of weather, but it is cruel to be in here. There are about 192 prisoners here at present. I think I will finish this time. So goodbye, hoping the restrictions will be off when you write again. Sincerely yours, Teddy. And in, in many cases, um, if they had signed along the dotted line accepting the free state, you know, conditions would have eased and they probably would have been released, but of course they didn't. Um, that's the nature of, of, of civil war. Um, you make up your own minds about it, of course, um, but there is a certain glory attached when you look at, because having done two books, I mean, in the War of Independence book, um, I it's, it's very black and white and it's a struggle for freedom. The Civil War is, 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 after spending the amount of time I have spent with it and reading pretty much all the secondary stuff, I still don't know what it was about. And, and that maybe at the end of the day is the deepest part of the, of, of the tragedy. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>